also uh, honored a pastor in his absence. This is a uh, this is a time of testing for our, for our family and for pastor. So the first thing I want to do is go to the Lord in prayer. Yes. All right, in our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning. Yes. We come to you, Lord, humbly, Lord, to ask you, Lord, to bless this service, Lord. Bless your word, Lord. Help me, Lord, to say what you would have me to say and only what you would have me to say, Lord. Yes. We also we come together as a family, Lord, yes. lifting up the pastor, Lord, yes. in, in the hospital, Lord, asking, Lord, that you heal his body, Lord, yes. and give him peace, Lord, and, Lord, set the path straight for him for his healing, Lord, and his progression from the spot he's at now, Lord, to full restoration, Lord. Yes. And every other thing we don't know to ask for, Lord, please add it to us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Well, first and foremost, God is a God of order. Yes. So there's a there's a lot of times in life, if it's kindergarten, if it's junior high, high school, even when we're at work, that that when when the authority figure's not there, we, we kind of start going, hey, how how things gonna be? But you know what? God's a God of order, and we're gonna do everything that we need to do to honor God to make sure that what He would have us to do gets done and what the pastor in his absence would like to have this done as the overseer of this church gets done in that way. Can I get y'all to say amen on that? Amen. All right. So the title of this is, it is a fight, but it's God's fight. All right, so we're going to go to 1 Peter 4 and 12. When y'all are there, say amen. It's okay if it takes us a little while. That's that's just our training. That's that's our training, and as we get better, we'll go faster. But let the Lord know. Amen. All right. I'll read First Peter four and twelve. Beloved, so we start out in a loving way. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. And as I was as I was getting the scriptures that the Lord had for me, I I looked at this. I'll read it again. Beloved, think about strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you yeah. as though some strange thing happened to you. So I said, you know, it isn't strange. But somehow it always does feel strange. Sometimes when, when things come up, the first thing we say is, where, where did that come from? Why is this happening? Well, this first part, and, and it broke down to three different parts. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials. What this was initially referring to was the, was the church back then. And it was, the, it was a specific church, but it was saying about the persecutions that they were going through. And these persecutions were such that they were being martyred meaning they were being killed for the name of Christ, so much so that they were being burned alive. Right. So again, we look at that, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. And then when it says, which is to try you, that means permitted by God to try our faith in Christ and the truth and promises of his gospel. So as we're going through trials, and trials never feel good, let's, let's be honest. We're never be tried, and our faith is being tried, and also the truth and the promises of the gospel. Um, sister just told us, she asked the Lord last night, she asked the Lord, she said, Lord, I need a word. I need a word. I, I need to hear what you have to say, because I need some peace. And a lot of the times, we look at the word when the sun's shining and things are going well, and we always respect it. But I tell you what, something, something happens that's hard, we want to hear from the Lord. And that's when we focus down and we pray and we're looking 
for him to speak into the situation, if it's through the printed word, or even if it's through the Lord speaking through someone else. And this last part, as though some strange thing has happened. And that means it's not strange. It's not uncommon. We are children of the Most High God. And it's a fight. Yeah. And sometimes we're on top of the mountain and the sun's shining and we're smelling flowers. And other times we get punched in the stomach and pushed on the ground. So, as though something strange happened, different or beyond from that which you were taught to expect. As we even think, is what the world teaches us to expect and what the Lord says that we can expect. And us in our modern culture, we got the name it and claim it culture. You know, you give 10%, God's gonna give you back 500%, all those different kind of things. And that's what the world is trying to teach us to expect. They're trying to hijack what the Lord said, twist it, and then hand it back to us and say, no, 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 this is what he meant. And it's to our best advantage to understand what the Lord said. This is what you can expect, because we can trust that. So once again, let's put it all together. Beloved, think are not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you. It's like I can almost hear, hear Peter say, no, don't, don't, don't get caught thinking that this is something odd or this is something strange that's happening to you. Because as you serve the Lord, you're in a fight. And in the fight, you're going you're gonna to give some punches and you're going to take some punches. And that's not strange for that situation. So let's, let's look at who Peter was. This, this was Peter on down the line after he had walked with Jesus, after he had been in the Garden of Gethsemane and Christ had been taken and Christ uh, was killed, resurrected, and went back to the Father. And then he started his ministry. So this is him at the point where he was mature in his ministry. He could look back and have a wealth of experience and say, you know what? This is my comment on it. So let's let's go back to his beginning, around when he was walking with Christ, and kind of see what's going on and see how he reacted to things. And I'll read. Let's go to Mark 36, 26 through 31. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, it's important when we're talking about the word that we don't misinterpret the word. So I would, I would definitely encourage you to go to Ezekiel in the Old Testament where that's first said, and then go to Mark and read the whole chapter so you can get the context. But let's talk about the concept of sheep, a shepherd, and that that concept of when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. The sheep depend on the shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd and we depend on the Lord. And no one's gonna strike the Lord and uh Make us scatter. But I tell you what, as we go through the things that we go through, we have to make sure that as we understand things, we go, well, what is our what is our situation? And is there anything that we can glean from this? Peter said to them, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, this very night. Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And usually that's about as far as we get. But he said vehemently, which means forcefully and earnestly, 
He said, quote, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. People always give Peter a hard time. Oh, man, no, he, he did this, he did that. But you know what? I honestly feel in my heart Peter was being earnest. Peter, Peter honestly thought that that's what he would do. He honestly thought that. So that's why he said what he said. Okay, let's go down to Mark 14, 46 and 47. And this is referring to what they did to Jesus. And they laid their hands on him, meaning Jesus, and took him. In verse 47, and one of them, meaning the disciples that stood by, drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Okay, so some action started to happen. Mm -hmm. So Peter, Peter told him if he had to die, he wouldn't deny him. And somebody came over there and put their paws on Jesus and they were one ear less. <laughs> because Peter was ready to fight. Mm -hmm. He was like, if we got to get down, we're going to get down. <laughs> and we're going to do whatever we got to do. And he cut his ear off. <coughs> so let's go to John 18, 10 and 11. When y'all are there, if you would, say amen. Amen. Okay. All right. And I'll read from King James Version. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheep. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So Peter, Peter had his way of doing what he wanted to do. He said, hey, if this is going down, this is going down the way that I want it to go down. Somebody's gonna get their ear cut off, and if we gotta go further than this, that's where we going. Because I, because he felt like he wasn't gonna deny him, and if somebody was gonna come up and use force, then he was gonna use force. But then, he got told, hey, put that away. <coughs> and he got told it by the Lord. And the Lord told him, if that was his cup, that from the Lord, from God in heaven, that's what he was going to drink. So Peter's thoughts about that situation changed because what he had to work with, that sword, all of a sudden, the Lord had taken it away from him. Mark 14, chapter 50th verse. And I'll read it. Then everyone deserted him and fled, meaning Jesus. So during this time, they were all there and they said, Jesus, we got you. We're going to be there for you. People came and tried to put their paws on Jesus. Peter cut their ear off. Jesus said, cut it out. Put his ear back on. And they took him. After that, they all scattered. And let's go to verse 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him. That means to hit him. And say unto him, prophesy. The servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. Peter was beneath, and this is further down, verse 66. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. And he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. So on the first one, he said, 
I don't know, nor do I even understand what you are saying, lady. And the maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, this is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little later, after they had stood by, said again to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereunto. Or otherwise, you sound like one. And he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And we usually glide over this part, but, but let's break down that part. It says, he began to curse and swear. There's a technical term called anathematize. And basically what that means is he was saying, may this happen to him or whatever, if what he's saying is not the truth. That's, that's a pretty heavy duty thing. And a curse, by definition, is a solemn utterance intended to evoke a supernatural power to inflict harm or punishment on someone or something. So he was calling curses on himself. So this man was scared. And the second time, the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the, the word that Jesus had said unto him. Before the cock crowed twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereupon, he wept. First and foremost, we're doing a lot of reading, but the fact of the matter is, the word of the Lord does not come back void. I can stand up here and talk to you all day, but if I'm talking and I'm quoting the word of the Lord, it's going to touch hearts, and that's, that's the purpose of the Lord. Yeah. So, so we can see Peter, Peter meant well. Peter meant well. He meant well. And he said what he was going to do. And when given a tough situation, and they grabbed him, Peter had a way that he wanted to pull something out of his back pocket and said, this is how I'm going to deal with it. This is how I'm dealing with this. But then... The Lord told him, you don't, you don't get to deal with it like that. You can do that. That co-worker that gets on your nerves at work, you can knock him in the head. You can do that. Probably not the best thing for you to do. You can do it. But you got to put that away. You can't cuss him. Can't do nothing like that. You know, you, you can't. If you know a way to get free cable, can't do that. There's ways that in the world we know how to deal with certain stuff, but, but Christ will tell you, put that away. Put that away. But us and, and the Lord, even if we've been following since we 14, 22, the past two weeks, we're sitting there with all these tools, all our worldly tools saying, oh, I know how to do it. I know how to get free cable. I know how to get that person in the next cubicle to shut up. I know how to do all that stuff. I know exactly how to do it. And the Lord's like, put that up. You ain't got to drop it. Then who are you? Then who are you? You sit there and, and all the things the we us's have collected. We ain't got them no more. We ain't got them. So we're standing there. So while we got all of our tools, and, and Peter was like, we can look at Peter, and we know Peter had his tool, and he drew back and cut off Malchus's ear and said, you know, y'all want some more? Come on, get it. Come on, get it. <laughs> but then once that was taken away from him, is it so far-fetched to think he was scared? Is it so far-fetched to think he, he was like, look, he didn't know what to do. He was scared, and he ran off. And if we be honest with ourselves, we all, in the flesh, have that. We all get scared. We all see some scary stuff and just want to run. Hey, man, I don't, don't want to deal with this. I, if I ain't allowed to do that, then I don't even know how to deal with this. So, let's look at 2 Corinthians 10. Forty-six, 
And this is something that Paul wrote. And remember Paul. When Paul was in the world, Paul was a persecutor of the church. When he was Saul, he was constantly knocking people in the head, arresting them, doing all kinds of stuff too. When y'all are there, say amen. 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 All right. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 6. Actually, let's go to 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So that's saying, though we walk in our flesh day to day, we don't war after our flesh. And it said war. Mm -hmm. And war is a big old fight. Mm -hmm. So right there, as we have those tools of the world, and if we think about it as spiritual people, if those are tools of the world, whose tools are those? Those are Satan's tools. Mm -hmm. Satan, Satan's seen every, everything that is his that's been touched, he knows about it. But Paul, as he got out of the world, he said, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And, and this man, when he was Saul, that's all he did was war after the flesh. Mm -hmm. So as we look at all the challenges we have, we have to remember, it is a fight. But it's God's fight. Yes. So we got to war on our knees. We have to war and say, Lord, we are your children. We're the sheep of your pasture. And all those things, that's, that's what Paul was saying, that everything he had in the world, he counts as dumb. He thought it was valuable, but then once the Lord opened his eyes to revelation, he was like, this, this ain't worth anything. And he's saying that our workings of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. So as we pray, as we pray for homes, as we pray for our beloved pastor to get well, all those things, we have to war the way that God's given us tools to war with because it is a war. Is, is something coming against the pastor? Yes, something is coming against the pastor and something's coming against this congregation because like, like the pastor always said, a dog doesn't bark at parked cars. So it's obviously the Lord is moving in this congregation and the forces of evil are trying to come against it. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but through God and might to the pulling down stronghold. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to war, but we're going to war the way that God would have us to do it. Amen. Calling on him because the victory is in him. Go to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And we were talking about reading a lot. I'm going to tell you a little trivia information. We always hear the word gospel. The word gospel, when you break it down into, I believe it's Middle English or Old English, means the good spell. And they just flashed it. Gospel, good spell. So even back then, they knew there were bad spells. But then when they looked at this book, they said, you know what? Anytime the words are spoken in this holy book, things change, and they change for the better. So as we speak this gospel and we speak this good spell, we're going to pray and ask God for the changes that he wants. And I'll read. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in an evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we're putting on the whole armor of God. We're putting on the whole armor of God. And we're praying, and we're also praying and using that sword to move forward. And we're also having on our breastplate of righteousness, the helmet and the shield to protect ourselves. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 2 and 10. Amen. All right, I'll start reading. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our people, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Let's stop there for just a moment. It says that the gospel is veiled by the God, little g, of this age. And that means Satan. That means all those folks out there who don't have anything to do with church or Christ, it's because the truth of what it is has been veiled from them. They don't understand it like you understand it. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. And for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, make his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. For we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We, are always, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So, it's a tough message, but it's a good message. Because it's about a fight. Nobody likes fights. But to fight, we have to know how to fight, and we have to know how to war. And we have our part. And that's praying. And when everything is well, and praise God for that. Praise God for it. When those trials come up, God has given us tools. He's, he's given us prayer. He's given us fellowship. He's given us each other. And we have to come together. We have to pray. We have to love each other. We have to lift those up that we need to lift up. And we have to continue in the Lord to move forward. And we have to ask him. We have to pray. And we have to petition him for the victory. And God is faithful and just. God is faithful and just. 
Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Lord, you've heard the word that we've said here, Lord. We've said your words, Lord. We've quoted the Bible, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you bring in increase, Lord, for bless kingdom ministry, Lord. We ask that you bless us, Lord. Lord, you see the trials that we're going through, Lord. Lord, help us to put down the worldly ways that we deal with things, Lord, and the worldly ways that we may think of, Lord, and to pick up those weapons that you would have us pick up, Lord, so we can pull down strongholds as we're trying to come against us as individuals, Lord, and against blessed kingdom ministry and against the pastor, Lord, who's your overseer over this ministry, Lord. Lord, we call you Father, we call you Abba, we call you Jehovah Jireh, Lord, the one who provides, Lord, and we're asking for your provision in this, Lord. Lord, thank you for sparing the pastor, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that people are looking at him and saying, how do you look that well? Well, we know how he looks that well. We praise God, Lord. I praise you and I thank you for being able to stand here and, and to be healthy and be in my right mind and even to be blessed to help other people, Lord. And that is from you, Lord. And I praise you and I thank you because I know, Lord, and I want other people to know, Lord, that it was you who brought me through, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you bring the pastor through, Lord, that you give him help, that you give him strength, Lord, and that you show yourself mighty on his behalf, Lord. We ask for blessings for the pastor's family, the first lady, and the children, Lord. Lord, we ask for blessings of peace, Lord, and comfort for them, Lord, in everything that they stand in need of. We ask for blessings of comfort for his mother and peace, and Lord, in everything else that we don't know to ask for, Lord. We're asking for it, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you hold bless kingdom ministry tight in your arms, Lord. Allow us, Lord, day to day, moment by moment, Lord, to progress forward and to be the family that you would have us to be, Lord. We ask that you call your mighty warring angels, Lord, to come down, Lord, and encamp around about us here and even at our homes, Lord, your ministering angels to do the same, Lord, that we may move forward as a family, Lord, and fulfill the purposes that you have for us as a family yes. of Christ, Lord. And all of the things we don't know to ask for, Lord, we ask that you add them to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And God, my Father, in heaven. Amen. Amen. Amen.